the first part of this video is devoted to Dexter or exchange energy transfer, and I want to start things off with a very simple and intriguing exercise. Let's imagine a molecule in its ground state. Let's call it R. The ground state of R is going to have two electrons with opposite spins in the HOMO, right? And the LUMO will be empty. Now let's imagine in the same solution, an excited state molecule, let's call it M star. And this excited state molecule, as we've seen, is going to have one electron in the HOMO of the ground state and one electron in the LUMO of the ground state. And, and you know, we would refer to these in our language as SOMOs, right? We have a higher energy SOMO and a lower energy SOMO. What happens if we exchange electrons between these two molecules? What happens if we take the higher SOMO electron in M star and we give it to R and we take one of the lower energy electrons in R, in the HOMO, and we give that electron to the lower energy SOMO of M star? Let's draw out what happens. One electron remains in the former HOMO of R that is now a SOMO. Two electrons are now present in the former lower energy SOMO of M. This electron highlighted in blue is now occupying the upper level or the former LUMO of R, and M's upper SOMO, higher energy SOMO, is now empty. Let's survey what we've got here. We've got two electrons in a HOMO of M and a LUMO of M that is now empty. This is M in its ground state. And now R has two orbitals with one electron each, a pair of SOMOs. R is now in an excited state and M is in its ground state. And it was all through this electron exchange process. This is the essence of Dexter energy transfer, the exchange of electrons between an excited state molecule and a ground state molecule, leading to conversion of the excited molecule back to its ground state and the ground state molecule to an excited state. We'll get into the potential energy surface nature of Dexter energy transfer in this video, as well as the distance dependence. And then we'll say a few words about trivial energy transfer, this idea of emitting a photon and then absorbing a photon as a means for energy transfer inside a solution at the end of this video. Okay, so that fun little electron exchange exercise gave us a sense that we need to move electrons from the donor to the acceptor and vice versa and vice versa in order for exchange energy transfer to take place. This means that a collision is required, right? Since electrons have to change hands between the donor and acceptor molecules. And this gives us a sense of what has to happen in a potential energy surface sense. So here I'm charting the distance between the donor and acceptor on the x-axis and the energy, the potential energy of the situation on the y-axis. This is a potential energy surface diagram. On the right, D and A are at very far distances, and the excitation states are different. Notice we're charting D having the excitation energy, A having the excitation energy, and both being in their ground states. And of course, over here on the far left, D and A are essentially sitting on top of each other. What happens as an excited energy donor, D star, approaches a ground state A? Well, imagine our representative point, starting out right here and moving to the left. As D and A approach one another, the excitation energy becomes delocalized over both D and A. And at some point, we reach a well where we're at an energy minimum. We can represent this well kind of qualitatively as a complex DA in which the excitation energy is actually delocalized over both D and A at the same time, almost like a ground state complex was photo excited, right? Imagining that is a good way to think about an exaplex between DNA. And we'll say more about exaplexes here shortly. A little bit beyond the exaplex with DNA a little bit closer to one another leads to a point where the potential energy surfaces cross of the excitation energy being on D and the excitation energy being on A. At some point, it becomes favorable for the excitation energy to shift to A. And at that point, our representative point crosses over from the D star A potential energy surface to the D A star potential energy surface. Another different exaplex is reached where most of the excitation energy is now on A rather than on D. So it's not exactly symmetrically disposed in these two exaplexes. 
And at that point, then, these molecules may do one of two things. Either they may separate so that A star goes off, and this kind of exaggerates the barrier associated with this. Often there's very little barrier for that separation process to take place. Or we may see, for example, an emission of DNA back down to the ground state from this exaplex. And of course, the desirable result, what we want to happen is for A to diffuse away from D, getting to a point where our representative point is now down here with A star far separated from D. If we can achieve that without this emission process or radiationless decay back down to the D plus A ground state surface happening, we've done dexter energy transfer. And again, the overall trajectory starts up here on the D star A process, moves down into a D star A exaplex, crosses over into a D A star exaplex, and then there's a dissociation process that releases A star from that exaplex, giving us free A star. Quantum mechanically, we can represent Dexter energy transfer as a shift from an initial wave function where the excitation energy is completely localized on D, psi D star psi A, and that's represented on the potential energy surface diagram by this representative point right here, to a final state where the excitation energy is localized on A, this was where it was on our potential energy surface diagram, and the wave function for that would be psi D, D in its ground state, times psi A star with A in its excited state. Using Fermi's golden rule, we can get a sense of the rate of this transition via its quantum mechanical likelihood or, or probability, right, in applying Fermi's golden rule. So K is proportional to the square of the matrix element associated with this initial and final state of the Hamiltonian that provides the mechanism for the energy transfer process. And that Hamiltonian is associated with that exchange of electrons in the orbitals that we just saw. So we can imagine the initial state perturbed by this Hamiltonian. Let's underline that initial state in yellow since that's how we represented it above. The initial state is perturbed by the Hamiltonian HE. This leads to some probability to end up in the final state with the excitation energy on A, which we represented in green, and the projection of HE time applied to the initial state onto that final state squared is proportional to the rate. We won't get into the details here, but of course, if we're worried about quantum mechanical selection rules associated with a particular exchange energy transfer process, we may wanna kind of open the hood and peer under this a little bit. One thing that's worth saying right off the bat concerns singlet and triplet energy transfer under the exchange mechanism. Because of this idea, singlet to triplet or triplet to singlet exchange energy transfer is forbidden at zero order, since there is no overlap between the singlet and triplet wave functions. They're orthogonal. We've already seen the basic picture of exchange energy transfer as involving the exchange or the transfer of electrons between an excited and a ground state. Here I want to deepen this picture a little bit. So first let's start and remind ourselves of our, the basic concerted mechanistic picture that we developed at the start of the video. An electron moves from the really higher energy SOMO, what's labeled here as the LUMO of D star, into the higher energy level of A, and an electron from A in its HOMO moves over to the lower energy level of D star, and the result is D in its ground state, and the orbital occupancy suggests that, and A in its excited state. The way we've drawn it here, the orbital energies are exactly equal, and in that case, the electron transfers will be perfectly concerted, since electrons are not going up or down in energy as this process takes place. And in fact, this is an exactly reversible process as well, right, since the energies of the orbitals are the same on the right, as they are on the left, at least in theory, in this highly contrived situation. More often than not, D and A will not have equal orbital energies. And when that's the case, we can have what we might call oxidative or reductive mechanisms taking place. And these terms oxidative and reductive refer to what happens to the excited state. So for example, in the oxidative mechanism, the first thing that happens is oxidation of the excited state D star. In other words, an electron moves from the upper SOMO of D star into the LUMO of A before there is an electron transfer back from what is now a radical anion, A dot minus. This happens after the formation of A minus.
So it's a two-step process with oxidation of the excited state first, the oxidative mechanism. And this is typical when the orbital energies of A are lower than the orbital energies of D. Under those circumstances, it becomes energetically favorable for an electron to move from the upper SOMO of D into the lower energy LUMO of A. Now the flip side of that, of course, is what we might call a reductive mechanism. And in this picture, it's the blue electron that moves first to create a radical anion of D and a radical cation of A before the higher energy electron moves, which happens in a second step. So again, two-step process with reduction of the excited state happening first. And of course, this is typical when A has higher orbital energies than D. Since the transfer of an electron from the higher energy HOMO of A to the lower energy LO SOMO of D star is energetically favorable. The last thing I'll say about these oxidative and reductive mechanisms is that they exist on a continuum, right? We may or may not see discrete radical cations and anions in an electron exchange process, but we can think about charge transfer within a sort of semi-concerted or concerted but asymmetric electron exchange process where one electron is transferred more than the other at the transition state for the process, for example. We might think, for instance, about the nature of the exaplex where electron transfer is happening. In a mechanism that is not quite fully reductive, but one that leans reductive, we would expect partial negative charge on D and partial positive charge on A in the transition state for the electron exchange process. And of course, the oxidative sort of mechanism, or not fully oxidative, but with oxidative character would have partial positive charge on D and partial negative charge on A in the transition state for the electron exchange process. Now, let's talk about the distance dependence of dextra energy transfer. Qualitatively, we've already said that a collision is required. Orbital overlap is required in order to do these electron exchange processes. And so the distance dependence is going to involve the distance dependence of orbitals, of molecular orbitals. Molecular orbitals typically exhibit an inverse exponential dependence on distance. Here we're calling that distance RDA, the distance between the donor and acceptor. As we move those apart, the value of the wave function decays exponentially. And that's part of this equation, and it's this term right here, this inverse exponential dependence on the distance between D and A. The rate of exchange energy transfer also depends on the spectral overlap integral, the overlap integral between the emission spectrum of the energy donor and the absorption spectrum of the energy acceptor. And that's summed up in this value here, J. So two key components, the spectral overlap integral, and this is normalized for the absorption coefficient of the acceptor, and the inverse exponential dependence of the rate on the distance between D and A having to do with the fact that wave functions decay exponentially with distance as we move away from the molecule. A couple of important implications of this. The rate is independent of the absorption characteristics of A. This comes from the fact that the spectral overlap integral is normalized for the absorption coefficient of the acceptor. Qualitatively, the acceptor does not actually absorb a photon or absorb radiation, and so the extent to which it absorbs at the energy of interest is irrelevant to the electron exchange process, provided thermodynamically it's able to accept the electron. Collision is required, and it becomes negligible when the distance between D and A is greater basically than the van der Waals radii of the donor and acceptor molecules. If we want to think about this in a relatively simple picture, exchange energy transfer can only happen when the orbitals of DNA are overlapping. When the distance between DNA becomes greater than the sum of their radii, and thus their orbitals are essentially separated in space, dexter energy transfer does not take place at anything resembling a useful rate. Let's finish off with a brief discussion of trivial energy transfer. And this is the process of an excited state emitting a photon, D star going to D and emitting a photon, and that photon being captured or accepted by A in the same solution to form A star. And this is called trivial energy transfer. 
Why is it called trivial energy transfer? Well, in my mind, it's called this because this process can be completely broken down into a radiative transition in D and a radiative transition in A. And it is nothing more than that, right? There's nothing fancy about this. It is simply, say, fluorescence of D and singlet, singlet absorption of A. And so if we want to talk about the rate of trivial energy transfer, it's all about the rates of the individual processes involved, the fluorescence process and the absorption process. And so things like the quantum yield of emission by D is critical. We want D to emit as much as it can if we want a fast rate of trivial energy transfer. The concentration of A, how many molecules of A get in the path of emitted photons, right, is, is critical, and that depends on concentration. The absorptivity, the absorption coefficient of A is critical. Again, we want A to have a high probability of absorbing the photon when the photon strikes it to form A star if we want a high rate of trivial energy transfer. And then finally, spectral overlap of the emission of D and absorption of A is critical, and this is a conservation of energy thing now. The photons that are going to be emitted by the energy donor are going to fall under this red curve right, in, in energy, at energies where we have significant emission intensity underneath the red curve. And the wave numbers under the blue curve are going, going to correspond to energies that A is capable of absorbing, right? So there needs to be overlap between those two. Otherwise, you know, D will be emitting photons that are too low energy for A to absorb, for instance. And we can talk about this spectral overlap integral A as basically taking the emission intensity, ID, of the donor and the absorption intensity or the absorptivity or absorption coefficient of the acceptor, multiplying those together and integrating over the entirety of both spectra with respect to wave number to find a, a value for the spectral overlap integral. Qualitatively, it's this area under both curves where they overlap.